This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Made London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Made London today. Today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Maureen O'Connell. Dr. O'Connell is chair of the Department of Religion at LaSalle University in Philadelphia, where she is also an associate professor of Christian ethics. We discuss her book that was released last week, Undoing the Knots, Five Generations of American Catholic Anti-Blackness, and much more. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be. Welcome back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And we are back for our fourth episode of season six. And I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church in London. I'm sometimes known as Revy Kevy, Kevin George over here at uh, St. Aidan's Church in the northwest corner of the beautiful city of London, Ontario, voted second, the world's second most famous London for every year running. My name is Ian. I am a producer, content creator, and the person sending this podcast out to your ears. I hope you're having a good day. All right. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> well, let's uh, get this one underway today, guys, because we've got a very special guest coming in to join us momentarily. Uh, today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Maureen O'Connell. And Dr. O'Connell is chair of the Department of Religion at LaSalle University in Philadelphia. Not to be confused with LaSalle, Ontario. Not LaSalle, our Ontario. Down there. It's a little bit there, different. There's no Department of Religious Studies in LaSalle, no, Ontario. No. They do have an awesome strawberry festival every year in LaSalle, Ontario. So they do. Got to get down to see And uh, how can we not talk? How can we talk about LaSalle without doing a shout out to Stan Fraser? Hello, Stan. Stan, Stan, <laughs> our good buddy. Um, but anyway, she, she is in LaSalle University in Philadelphia. And she's also uh, an associate professor of Christian ethics an expert in the art of social justice, an award-winning author, faithful member of POWER, which is Philadelphians organizing to witness, empower, and rebuild. And uh, POWER is this wonderful, an interfaith federation of 90 faith communities committed right now to making Philadelphia the city of just love, as well as brotherly love and sisterly affection. And uh, through a more uh, wage for workers, uh, fair funding for public schools, immigration reform and decarceration. So some great work being done there. And uh, Dr. O'Connell also has a book that was released just last week called Undoing the Knots, Five Generations of American Catholic Anti-Blackness. And Dr. O'Connell will be with us momentarily. Yeah, you're, you folks are gonna love this book. Uh, it's a, a deeply honest <clears throat> appraisal of um, every generation of her own family settlement into the United States uh, mm. and, and up to now. Um, anyway, lots more on that later. Before we go any further, we do want to acknowledge that the lands upon which we record this podcast are the traditional lands of the Anunnaki, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Wakanatawandra, and peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. These lands continue to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we uh, respect as contemporary stewards of this land and vital contributors of our society, people with whom we want to continue to work and prayerfully consider what a future of reconciliation looks like. Mm, very good, very good. And, you know, guys, we, we really do acknowledge too that uh, there are, well, four things that we could not do this podcast without. Mm -hmm. One, of course, is the internet. Yes. Uh, and the internet, and it just kind of does its thing. It's like, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit. We don't know how yep. it works, yep. but it shows up and it's does there. what needs it's to be there. done. So Somehow there's the internet. There. Yep. Yep. 
And of course, our wonderful sponsors who we want to recognize today as well to uh, A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated. Our thanks and a big shout out to Dave Mullen and his entire staff at A. Miller George Funeral Home today. And I want to do a shout out to my uh, drug supplier, uh, Carol Basada. Carol is, uh, is the owner, operator, pharmacist of uh, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved. And let me just say, she's got some really good stuff. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, I won't stall this time, we have Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Trisha Lister, the wonderful human being out there who hooked us up with that one. So many thanks to you out there. Um, Molly Maid, a clean, clean it all up. Clean it all <laughs> up. Clean it all up, baby. <laughs> it's clean, it's clean, it clean it up. Clean it all up. Mess and get out of here. You just get That's that right. thing shiny. Yeah. yeah, we love it. All right, guys, this is our fourth episode of our sixth season, and we've got a lot more to come between now and the end of this season. So it's time for the uh, latest um, part of our Vickers Crossing podcast, which we like to call, hey, Kevin, who in the world did you book this week? And I really like that you say who in the world. Drum roll, please. Because in the world, we went across the pond for our booking this week to Janelle Aldred and Janelle Ooh. Aldred's written a great book uh, and it's called communicating. I got to turn it around so I can read it. <laughs> Communicate for change. <laughs> and uh, if you watch the BBC at all, uh, she's not on there all, as much now because she was actually on the BBC regularly as a commentator. Now she's on there from time to time. You'll see her on CBC. She's also at one point was uh, the, the uh, policy and, and uh, promotional person for a tear fund, which is a Christian organization. She's an incredible person uh, mm -hmm. who's really working to uh, sort of in the spirit of the podcast with the special we did last week, who's really working to help bring down the divides that exist between people. Mm -hmm. um, so in fact, I most recently saw her on the CBC talking about Prince Andrew, speaking about taking down. Oh, the okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. Speaking of divisions and families. I'm yeah, sure that's, I'll tell you uh, what. that's quite a lot of chatter going on in the, so, in the yeah. palaces these days. She yeah. should be fun. Maybe we yeah. can get the low down on the on the on the uh, on the royal family when we get her on so yeah was, yeah well, that's great and in, these, <laughs> and in these pandemic times when i i honestly i don't know if we'll ever travel again it's nice to go across the pond virtually to do amen that. so that's for sure that's kind of fun too so uh all right dr marino connell is our guest today on the vickers crossing and she's standing by so let's bring her in and get hey, this chat underway come on in and Dr. Maureen O'Connell is our guest today on the Vickers Crossing podcast, and she has found her way into our Zoom room. So happy to have you here, Maureen. Thank you for joining us. And how are you in Philly today? Oh, we're great. It's really, really good to be here. So thanks so much for the, the invitation and a chance to talk. And yeah, we're having a little bit of, of winter here, um, which is nice. Appropriate, oh, seasonally it. appropriate. That's yeah, great. So. I, I touched I touched the outskirts of Philly once years ago on a class trip we were taking and I went okay. to New York and it was nighttime when we were arriving and I was mm -hmm. driving and everyone was sleeping and yes. I didn't pay attention to where I was going and I went right past New York down I kept going and going and all of a sudden I saw this sign Philadelphia and, next like, exit. Ah. and I thought oh no I'm dead and I had to turn around ah. and uh, so that's well, about as close as I ever got but well, uh, I know least, it's a beautiful place at least you woke up before you got past the Mason yeah. Dixon line and some no. some New Yorkers call Philadelphia the sixth borough so oh, okay you know, um okay yes. you know yeah. It, yeah it's not that far so there's actually no. a number yeah. of people who yeah commute up to new york city from here but yeah no it's right. really it's beautiful it's a nice snowy afternoon and um yeah so it's a great great time to talk well you yeah. know i i got there once and that was uh for and it was an amazing place i i hadn't anticipated that but that, not that i haven't heard great things about it but i went there for a reason what i hadn't anticipated was all the history and you know, yeah. th that I didn't think I'd get into it, but we did. Uh, well, I, I went there because my wife is a big fan of Mandy Patinkin. And, mm. uh, and, mm. and it was Catherine Ann's birthday. And so I surprised her by not telling her where I was driving her. And we popped in and we drove from London, Ontario here to Philadelphia, which is about 12 or 13 hours. We stopped mm -hmm. partway. And we went to a little theater downtown whose name I now forget, but it was, like, it was only like three or 400 seats in this place. And it was Mandy Patinkin and Patti Lapone. Uh, singing Funny. the songs of Broadway and it was just really great mm. and we yeah. went to a where she was born in Seoul South Korea and uh, and uh, so we went to a, um, a Korean restaurant downtown which was amazing like 
a beautiful, just a great city. So good. I'm glad, glad you've had good experiences. Well, I'm I'm yeah. glad to, glad to have Philadelphia in London here today, mm. such as it is. So mm, good. Anyway, listen, we want to start with asking about power. Uh, now, power is uh, an acronym. Um, you are a member of St. Vincent de Paul Parish in Germantown. Um, yes. And through your work in that parish, you belong to a group called Power Philadelphians Organizing to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild. And I understand that this is an interfaith federation of over 90 faith communities committed to making Philadelphia a city of just love, which I like that, yes. um, yeah. as, as well as brotherly and sister, uh, brotherly love and sisterly affection. Can you tell us more about Power? I think it's just such an incredible, it sounds like such an incredible uh, movement. Sure. No, it is. So um, Power is um, the Philadelphia affiliate of a national here in the U.S., although I imagine they might have some um, also in Canada. I'll have to look because mm. um, Faith in Action is the overarching organization, mm -hmm. um, and there are affiliates of Faith in Action all over the country. Exactly. Um, and Faith in Action does do some international organi organizing, mostly in Latin America. You right. might have Faith in Action affiliates in some of your in some of your cities, um, but basically this is faith-based community organizing and interfaith community organizing. Um, and um, power has been around in the city of Philadelphia now for probably about maybe 15 years, maybe just under 15 years. There were other, um, other attempts at uh, interfaith organizing, um, but power with the help of the Faith in Action Network really took hold so much so that now power stands for Pennsylvanians. Oh, really? Wow. To witness and power and rebuild because one of the things um, that folks engaged in faith-based organizing for citizens of Philadelphia around issues that are impacting citizens in Philadelphia, there's this realization that if you want to affect change in Philadelphia, you've got to affect change at Harrisburg, which is yes, our capital. state capital, yeah. our Commonwealth capital. Um, but issues that are impacting folks in, in Pennsylvania are probably impacting um, economically disadvantaged folks across the state. Right. And so to build power, people power mm -hmm. across the state in this kind of um, federation that, as you said, now has about 90 congregations across the state. Mm -hmm. When that group gets together um, and has an action, you know, in Harrisburg or tr throw their weight behind a particular kind of campaign, say around fair funding for schooling, mm -hmm. um, they're able to nudge the, we're able to nudge the needle because there is a broad coalition of people who have committed together and bound, you know, um, who are working together around a shared vision and able to exercise a particular kind of power, a persuasive people power. Yeah. Um, that's very exciting. So, yeah, so that I, I got initially involved through my parish. There's not many Catholic parishes in Philadelphia who are doing this work. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write this right. book. Like why, why is it that mm. Catholics don't seem to get into this organizing thing? Right. Um, right. But I've also done some work at the, at, at the university. So at my university and three other Catholic universities here in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, we have kind of created um, what we would kind of consider a collegiate congregation that is part of power. So we're working yeah. with undergraduate students to, you know, to um, learn the fundamentals of organizing and build people power among students to affect issues that um, are on campus, but then also in the city. So it's been, it's been yeah. fantastic. Well, it, re it really sounds amazing. And I, I gather from what, how it's described that it is beyond Christian, right? There's a, a yes. Jewish, yep. it's Muslim. interfaith, Jewish, yeah. Muslim, Buddhist, secular humanists. Right. Um, you know, it is, it is deeply interfaith. And I think in some ways, um, that kind of relationship building work is what really contributes to the common good right. at the end of the day. Um, and so again, it, one of the reasons or one of the questions that kind of got me writing this book was really to say, why do we have so few Catholic in the city of Philadelphia, so few Catholic parishes yeah. doing, yeah. you know, uh, as members of this um, faith in action affiliates? Um, yeah. 
so so yeah well yeah and so the book uh here's here's a copy on doing the knots thank you for that um mm. five five generations of american catholic anti-blackness and you may be asking how did you get one so quickly kevin and it's because uh the the good people at the publisher at beacon press at beacon yeah they press. wanted to get it into your hands uh, so that yes. we could then have this conversation uh, so, big yeah. shout out to pam mccool uh for mm -hmm. hooking us up with that she also worked with us guys with aubrey hendricks dr hendricks uh, we interviewed a couple oh, weeks yep. ago yep. and wow. uh, so she was very helpful um they're very good uh, listen it, you describe at the outset of the book um in the introduction of on doing the knots which by the way when i saw the title my immediate reaction was about Mary, the undoer of knots. I'm not sure if yes. you're familiar with it. Yeah. Yes, and, I am. And uh, yeah. I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah. And I was like, that is such, like the title just leapt out at me. I like, because for those who haven't seen the painting, which the current Pope has written about uh, from his time before he was Pope, Pope Francis, but it's a beautiful painting of, of, um, of Mary. And on one side are these sort of spirits passing her a rope, which is totally knotted up. And she passes the rope through and there are angels on the other side, which are taking away a perfectly uh, untied, all the knots are untied. And it really, and, and you write in this book about the knots that are generational in, um, in our backgrounds that speak mm -hmm. to anti-blackness, uh, racism, mm -hmm. but what really provoked it in the introduction, you, you write about, um, uh, about the Black Lives Ladder, uh, Matter movement, mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, it begins in that parish community again of St. Vincent de Paul. Yes. And uh, you describe a meeting about erecting a Black Lives Matter sign. And this becomes pivotal in your decision to delve into this research into your family history and the history of American Catholic anti-Black racism in the United States. I wonder if you can share with our listeners a little bit about that experience of, of talking about putting that sign up and, and why that was at all sort of uh, an issue and what it raised yeah. in you. What it raised in you was what I found very interesting because it sort of startled you into a place, right? Yes. And, and, and why it's so, this book is so critically important right now. Yes, thank you for that, that great question. Um, so St. Vincent de Paul is a Vincentian parish um, and is one of the oldest in the city. So in, in the city of Philadelphia, it was constructed in the 1850s. So it's, it's a big, big old parish. Um, and in the last 15 years or so has merged with two other, um, two other Vincentian parishes or one other Vincentian parish and another parish in Germantown um, that had over you know, the last probably 50 or 60 years become primarily black um, parishes. St. Vincent's is itself a pretty progressive parish mm -hmm. um, and pulled people from all over the archdiocese of Philadelphia who were, for, who were looking for a, 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 a a progressive, um, a progressive parish with, with liturgy and liturgy that fueled and feeds um, commitments, justice commitments. So, mm -hmm. to climate change, to to immigration reform, to fair funding for schooling, to, um, so it's an integrated parish, which is unusual in a mm -hmm. city like Philadelphia, but not necessarily integrated by choice. Right, and the parish you know, has done and, and, you know, I'm a relatively new member of that parish or, you know, since I've moved back to Philadelphia almost 10 years ago. So there is a, there's been a, an ongoing commitment um, to figuring out how to take a, a parish that is now multicultural, or let's put it this way, that is diverse yes. and make it a multicultural faith community. The two things are not, not you know, same, synonymous same. or just because you have a diverse parish does not mean that it's going to be a place where um, folks feel included. Um, and so, you know, I was not necessarily privy to the to some of the decision making as much as in that in that that opening vignette in the story, I was at, I was traveling with a group from the parish to a big interfaith organizing um, gathering out in Fresno um, mm. and, um, and was kind of hearing this, this was evolving um, in the parish, this possibility of perhaps putting up a, putting up a banner. Um, and one of the, one of the folks in our cohort from St. Vincent's who are at this big gathering is a member of the parish and and he's a black man and when he heard the news he my you know he was not immediately um overwhelmed with with joy and was not did not find that news something that gave him 
um, a lot of hope. It gave him pause. And I think I was just very surprised that why, well, isn't it a good thing that we at St. Vincent's would want to put this kind of banner up? Um, isn't this something that we want to be affirming? Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of other Catholic spaces that are affirming mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And to learn from him a little bit, um, and to sort of actually watch some of the, how hard it was for him to actually then have to explain, get to another white person why, yeah. yes, this is a good thing to do, but we need to be consulting everybody before we do this. We need to talk with folks because maybe not everybody um, is, in, is in agreement, right? And well, why wouldn't people be in agreement? And he said, well, you know, part of it is we, it's an assumption on the part of, of white people that all black people think in the same way or are on the same page mm -hmm. with the Black Lives Matter movement or mm -hmm. the, or that, or that claim. Mm -hmm. um, there was some concern that, you know, um, the parish, there's not a lot of folks who live in the immediate neighborhood mm -hmm. who attend the parish would proclaiming that sign outside the parish create some, um, some pushback or some fallout, particularly from law enforcement, who still in the United States are, are not exactly on the same page with that with that affirmation. And then thirdly, it was you know this sense that it assumes that that is the case, and that Black people in St. Vincent de Paul actually do feel as though their Black and Catholic lives matter. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, again, I I I just was. I felt like that was a moment of grace and it was a painful one for Chris. And, um, you know, and he, there was conversation that happened and a banner did not immediately go up. And um, the folks who were involved, you know, with in a, in a committee in the, in the parish who were thinking about doing this, continued to consult and continued to converse. And it became a growing opportunity, um, but it was a very important learning moment. And I, I've heard it put a different way in a in a different context of white institutions wanting to do right yeah. by people of color, but missing the mark or missing the step. Mm. Um, you know, the the phrase that I've heard, and this comes from some of the descendants of people who um, were sold by Georgetown University, the Jesuits at Georgetown University. They say nothing about us without us. Mm. And so I think that was a very important learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then also made me realize that um, that is not something that I have been taught mm -hmm. in all of my years of Catholic formation. Right. I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about some of the central principles of justice that our traditions share. You know, that this preferential option for the poor, well, this mm -hmm. nothing about us without us is another way of, of articulating that. So it was a very big learning moment. And I think what I'm super proud of my, of my parish is that there is this realization, particularly for white folks in the parish, that this work is ongoing. Right. That this is not something that we ever arrive at, that we can't necessarily bring a fix it mentality to it. The mentality we need to bring is one of accompaniment and is one of turning and listening and being in deep relationship with the people who are most impacted by the pain of race and following their lead. Mm -hmm. um, and so there have been some really beautiful things that have happened in the parish since then. A group got together and designed a banner and it's a unique banner and it mm -hmm. does say Black Lives Matter, but it incorporates a cross in it, mm -hmm. right? It incorporates a central symbol, right, of the of the community. I think there were a number of conversations, and Chris was involved in some of those conversations, really talking about, well, what does it mean for Catholic communities to say um, Black Lives Matter? Um, we recently had to redo some of the really old frescoes mm -hmm. in the church because we had water damage and finally got the roof repaired, and it's time to repaint the murals. And so many of them have been repainted with Catholics of color and with Catholics who are part of the of the congregation now and mm -hmm. um, the scenes of the crucifixion are um, beautiful and they're all Afrocentric mm -hmm. figures right and mm -hmm. that hasn't come without again some of its own mm -hmm. its own pushback but there's space for conversation there's right. continued commitment to to trying to build trust and to try to really listen so that was such a gift that you know I, mm -hmm. I happened to sort of be with Chris as he was trying to wrestle with this and I'm grateful to him for his continued friendship and sort of, um, you know, he's a, he's a guiding light for me in some of this 
in trying to do this work. Well, that that certainly comes through in the book. And I mean, I think the image that came to my mind reading it was not just him wrestling, but it caused you to do a lot of wrestling. And the image that comes through for me uh, when I when I read it was a, a biblical image of Jacob limping away, uh, having wrestled, you know, is that, you know, this book in the end for me is you you really struggle with some difficult truths about the institutional Catholic church from your family, mm -hmm. being white in America. For, for us, we all have to do these things, or at least we should be doing these things. Yes. But but the, that wrestling is important work. And it sounds like Chris is the sort of person who really engages that way. And mm -hmm. he, he's modeled for you a way mm -hmm. for, for, for you to be able to do that as well. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's in that wrestling that God is made present and real, you know? So, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, yeah. that's right. And I think what I tried to do to that point, Kevin, is in each of the chapters of the book, tried to find the, the people who were like the Chris for yes, me. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, that were the people who were trying to invite um, white Americans, white Christians, white Catholics into that wrestling mm. with this truth that we spend an awful lot of time trying to deny and distance mm. ourselves from, and in doing that, only end up tying ourselves in knots. But in. in not owning this history, we lose all of those people too. And we need mm. those people because their faithfulness and quite frankly, their commitment to to predominantly white institutions, which we have to admit in the United States, the American church still very much is, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. such a, um, it is such an, you know, to say it's an inspiration almost seems to belie the kind of commitment it takes. It is a source of faith for me. Right. Let's yeah. put it that way. It is yeah. a real yeah. source of faith for me. Um, I have been so blessed, you know, to be able to worship in a community um, that struggles with all of that in such a very real way, because so many people in the community are very close to that, the pain of racism, of anti-Blackness, of white supremacy right. in the, in our society and in our church. And yet they still show up yeah. um, and they still show up with full hearts. And that to me is such an amazing source of grace mm, yeah, to be quite yeah, frank. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to shine a light on, on one of the themes you write about and this idea of uh, racial murder. And at the very uh, outset, you begin kind of setting the tone in the book by talking about, about racial mercy. And I'd just like to read a, a quote for our listeners from the book and then ask you something on the other side. You write that, you write that uh, racial mercy holds up before us those revolting, disgusting, disheartening tendencies cultivated in us over generations of getting tangled up in the color line. Racial mercy then gives us the courage to probe those tendencies cleanse their festering wounds and heal what they have infected. If justice is what love looks like in public, as Cornel West passionately intones, then racial mercy is the precondition for public expressions of love that resist racism. Racial mercy is what love looks like in the midst of our personal and public relationships, all of which have been distorted by our proximity to and participation in a culture of white supremacy in American Catholicism. So Maureen, for our listeners today, uh, particularly here in Canada, who may not be familiar with the color line, um, mm -hmm. can you first explain what that is and then maybe say more about racial mercy, particularly with your description of, of your journey along the color line in, in Catholic Philadelphia? Sure. No, that's great. And thank you. And it's so neat to hear, <laughs> hear my words. Your <laughs> words. Hey, your did, words did I, back did it. Ma no. Maureen says, did I write that? It's that's still so new, good. and I do think that. Did I make that? I wrote that. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, so to your first question, I mean, the phrase, the color line is something that's coined by um, a sociologist, a Black sociologist, W.E.B. Du Bois, and actually from his experience of studying um, the impact of race in the city of Philadelphia, right? So um, the color line really means that sort of stark difference that white supremacy has created in the United States where whiteness and white people are just valued more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a way of thinking about race that comes from a more contemporary scholar by the name of Eddie Glaude, who's got mm -hmm. a great book called Democracy in Black. Yeah. That you might and if you're, if you're listening, Eddie, we, we want you on here. That's a, yeah. Okay, we can Love work on the that. Guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, you know, in in at Princeton, in the in the uh, yeah. in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, in the seminary there. So, um, so that you know that was Du Bois, sort of his initial study in the early 1900s, 
in a ward not far from a ward where I had folks living. And so that's one of the chapters in the book trying to sort of explain how even after the Civil War and immediately after Reconstruction, this moment of Black freedom does not actually um, become such, at least mm -hmm. certainly not economically and in meaningful ways of enfranchising Black people because of this persistent color line that separates Black and white people. And then a few generations later in the 1930s, that becomes an actual line when the US government segregates um, housing um, when it, you know, in recovering from um, the, the depression and in some of the work of the New Deal, um, appraisers went in and figured out who would get federal funding for mortgages based on the racial makeup, um, either existing or predicted of certain neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. And so any neighborhood that had a certain percentage of people who were not white in it were labeled high risk and were redlined. So then that color line actually becomes a very real line, a very real boundary that is not permeable for people of color. Um, and we are living with the, the after life of that now mm -hmm. for a few generations here in the city of Philadelphia. So that's that notion of the, of the color line and it has wreaked havoc um, for many generations. And so that idea of racial mercy for me comes from my one of my professors when I was in graduate school, um, a, 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 the, a, a, a Christian ethicist, a Jesuit Christian ethicist by the name of Jim Keenan. I remember him saying, when we had a class on virtue ethics, you know, that mercy is this virtue um, that allows us to step into the chaos of other people's lives. That's That was mm -hmm. his definition of mercy, which really resonated wow. um, in a very, you know, real way. It is the thing that allows us to get into and step into other people's chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I started to think about the chaos that racism has created, um, different kinds of chaos, but chaos. Um, and uh, I just thought to myself, like, you know, we don't white people, um, white people, white Americans, white Catholics, we don't fully understand that chaos because we can remove, we can segregate ourselves from it. Right. We can opt in and out of it when we so choose, even if we are committed to racial justice work. A colleague of mine, you know, has often said to me, a colleague of color of mine has often said, you get to put this work down when you get tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah, You know, I live it. So yeah. I'm committed to it intellectually, but I also live it in my life. And so I think what I'm trying to suggest with racial mercy is it's like the precondition or it's the first step that if, if white Catholics, the white Catholics who, who know that there's something wrong um, with how things are and know that something else could be possible, before jumping to that, you know, jumping into that fix it mode or jumping into that um, imagining mode or jumping into that, let me lead something mode. We need to do a little bit of this racial mercy thing first. We need to really allow ourselves as much as possible to learn and develop muscles of empathy for the chaos that race has created, not only in other people's lives, but in our own lives um, as well. And sometimes that's harder to do. Um, but that then allows, you know, the, the, it allows for this kind of, um, a kind of, a kind of healing that allows us maybe to show up more whole mm. because we've kind of done a little bit of a diagnostic inventory of our own wounds yeah. or the wounds that we're close to without perhaps being aware of it. Um, and we start to tend to those rather than bypassing that important step. Yeah, one of the interesting ways you talk about that is is Tura. Um, can you say something about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I was initially writing the book, and maybe this was because I was like, oh, this would be so fun because I was able uh, to have a research lead for my university, which is incredibly generous. And I'm very grateful to um, administrators at LaSalle University for making that happen. I envisioned that I was going to be going to Ireland because I was like, well, I need to know what was happening you know, before everybody arrived here. And if that means, you know, my husband and I get a little junket over to Ireland, well, that wouldn't be so sure. bad, right? That seems like a good way to spend. Yeah. Um, a talk, about, talk about Tura, that is like a tour. Of... That would be wonderful, right? Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that, I, I, it turned out that I actually didn't need to do that because there's just enough to do right here in the American context. 
but I did do some reading on Celtic spirituality and it's a Torah is a would have been a penitential rite that ancestors in Ireland would have done um, and it is a kind of rounding um, a Torah is a pilgrimage basically in Gaelic but these you know this penitential rite of of going out and rounding some kind of holy spot maybe it was a well maybe it was a a natural a natural outcropping of rocks or but you would go and you would you would make this rounding um, as part of your penitential practice attempting to kind of perhaps undo yourself loosen yourself from the grip of sin um, and then after that was finished you would you would kind of return to your to your life this was part of this Celtic penitential practice and it was called a you know it was called a pilgrimage and I was so fascinated to find that term um, and you know also just kind of grieve the fact that I got disconnected from that kind of rich practice um, that kind of rich spiritual distinct cultural um, practice because it would have been something that people gave away in order to accept the mantle of, of, um, of whiteness here in the United States, particularly as Irish Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, so I just really like that. And that's what I tried to mm -hmm. do in the book. Mm -hmm. I tried to round these different parishes that my people lived in and um, worshiped in and worked in and raised their children in and kind of circle these spaces, trying to learn more what was going on and, um, and what their experience might have been and how elements of their experience have become my experience and likely mm -hmm. in a far more intentional way than they would have been aware of or that I have been aware of. Right, right. Neat. Um, we, we started talking at the beginning of the uh, podcast about power and the acronym power that we were. Um, yes. That, I, there's another one that I want to throw out there too, which is MOVE, yes. um, which well, is originally yeah. a Christian Movement for Life. And uh, for our listeners, it's a, it's a communal organization that advocates advocates for uh, nature laws and natural living. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a little bit of history, uh, something that, that affected you and your life in 1985. Yeah. yeah. Um, a firefight with the police ended when a police helicopter dropped bombs onto the roof of the move compound. Like it was a townhouse, right? Yeah. Um, it was in Rohan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the resulting fire killed six uh, move members and five of their children and destroyed 65 houses in the neighborhood. And you're right about how you experienced that bombing of the move compound. And um, I'd like to let you share that story with our listeners. Um, but before we get to that, can I just read again? I was glad sure. to hear you're okay with me reading your words back to you. Yes, I wanted to do it one <laughs> wonderful. More time. Thanks but very much. But just write a little bit about it, this. Rob. And Thank then, you. Yeah, yeah, no, not at all. And then, then kind of get your response uh, and, and a little bit more about that experience. So in the book, you write, I am struck by all it has taken in order for that memory of May 13th, 1985 to really lay a claim on me to demand that I listen to the narratives swirling just below the surface of all that Catholic silence to demand that I believe the truths it holds. Six years of graduate level theological training, 16 years of teaching, reading, writing, 12 years of anti-racism training and community organizing and strategizing, eight years of worshiping among, among Black Catholics, eight years of teaching courses on theology and racism in racially mixed undergraduate classrooms, countless lectures and invited talks on racism and racial justice, and even one brief moment of coming face to face with the lone survivor of that horror. And yet, I have never really processed my move memories whether intellectually or spiritually, I am still not sure I believe my move memories. My dad made me a 12 year old witness to the violence of white supremacy. And since then I have lived in a Catholic silence that normalized that violence and expected little of me by way of reckoning with it. As a result, my extensive Catholic formation renders me largely incapable of effectively joining brothers and sisters of color who have been struggling to make their lives matter long before hashtags, mm -hmm. student colleagues, fellow parishioners, and neighbors. I am limited in my ability to respond, to love those neighbors, because I've not been forced to examine the truth about myself, about my family, about my church, about my tradition, where racism is concerned. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. 
Can, can you tell us the story of that, the memory of that day in 1985 and about meeting Ramona Africa, the lone mm. survivor of that mm. massacre? Mm. Yeah, for sure. But hearing that, like, I first, like, I just have to say, Lord, have mercy. The Lord, mm -hmm. have mercy. I, that, mm -hmm. that, in yes. fact, are the words yep. I said out loud when I read that, <laughs> because I, I, I just got a chill, because that's exactly what I said when I read it. Like, yeah. you've, uh. you've, laid a, you've laid out a litany of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and the many things that we would look at as great accomplishments, successes, and mm -hmm. everything along the way. And you've been incredibly honest about mm -hmm. about what's missing yeah and so yeah. thank you thank you for your well, honesty no thank you for that and thanks for finding that passage um yeah i mean the um the move event in philadelphia is such a significant i mean it's significant for the history of racism in the united states and but it's very significant in the history of philadelphia and we have yet really in any meaningful way as a city um, to turn and face that and allow that memory to continue to interrupt us and allow that memory to suggest that there has to be a very different way forward. Um, but, you know, it was a standoff that, you know, it was many years in the, in many years in the making, and it has all of the components that we recognize today um, in terms of, um, you know, this was a group that was very much unapologetically asserting the value of Black life, albeit mm -hmm. in a way that did not jive mm -hmm. with, um, you know, with a lot of the shared values of, of many people in the city of Philadelphia, and yet they were unapologetically committed um, to a kind of ecological consciousness and, um, uh, you know, uh, tapping into, in some ways, the history of a Black power movement. Um, but you know, it, so it was something that was building for a long time. And I just remember, I, I mean, I, I do say sometimes I wonder, did that really happen? But I, I know that it happened. Uh, my father got my sister and I out of bed and uh, put us in our pajamas in this family station wagon. We lived in the suburbs right on the line of the city and it was an elevated point. And he put us up on a picnic bench and, you know, you could see that the sky was orange. Now we mm. weren't in that neighborhood. One can only imagine the terror that it created for anybody. Yeah. And in fact, I think there were a lot of families around black families around the city of Philadelphia who said this could so very easily have been us, mm -hmm. um, right? Because in trying to evacuate that family or mm -hmm. that, that, that movement, that group of people, um, you know, they ended up dropping a bomb that, you know, incinerated an entire square city block. Um, mm. But we saw it. <laughs> and I think my father, that I think this is, you know, I try to explain and I still continue to try to explore the way in which my father knew that this was a significant moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. He knew that this was incredibly significant. He knew that it was important um, for us to see it, to witness it, to say, yes, this is happening. Um, and so in some ways, like there is a kind of, it, it signals a kind of consciousness mm -hmm. that I think many people have when they know that there is something wrong, particularly mm -hmm. around race. We know that, mm -hmm. we know that. Um, and yet there was no place to then act mm -hmm. upon that knowledge that we had that was something, there was something wrong. We just retreated into this silence. And you know, I'm 12 at the time. So who knows, maybe there were conversations, maybe there were things that have that were happening. And it was like, well, this isn't for 12 year olds. Yeah, sure. But I wasn't the only 12 year old around the city of Philadelphia who knew that that happened because it was on the news. In fact, I was just conversing with a colleague who's a couple years older than me who grew up in a in another suburban county and can re can recall with complete detail what was happening the night that that was all being telecast, right. Mm -hmm. So we knew and retreated into this kind of silence. And so you learn, you know, you learn that awful things happen to people. The best way, the only way to respond to that is with some kind of polite deference or polite silence. And I think that that was a response that my parents learned because right. that was what their parents taught them. And their parents learned that from, from, you know, um, from their parents. So it's this pass on sense that you know that there's something wrong, but you are not you know, encouraged to take any kind of responsibility or to lean on the elements of your faith or your faith tradition that um, you know you share with a, a vast, you know, not a majority, but a very strong network of people across the city to try to do something about that. And we still have not done that. Um, and so when a colleague who is not from Philadelphia is teaching a, you know, is teaching a class on 
on black religion mm. and invited, you know, invited Ramona Africa, the sole survivor who was educated in Catholic schools in Philadelphia mm -hmm. to come to campus. Um, you know, it really was this moment of like, Ramona Africa is in the chapel at our university. Mm -hmm. There's, there should be something that we should be there. This is momentous. Like what, mm -hmm. and then again, just not having my own wherewithal um, to know what to do other than to say, we probably shouldn't make too much of a big deal about this. Cause there'll be a lot of people who don't like the fact that Afro, uh, Ramona Africa has been invited to campus. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so feeling incredibly paralyzed Mm -hmm. behaving exactly the way that I was in many ways by my Catholic tradition formed to, right. to respond. But I do think, I do think Rob, like that memory, if I look back, it has to be part of the reason that I am so bothered by and have to write about, about race. Like sometimes I think, mm -hmm. well, couldn't I just be doing, why couldn't I do something <laughs> that would be a little less <laughs> stress inducing or something that would be easier on my stomach but i think yeah. there's a reason like i think it was because this has been something that has been i have known that there has been something right. wrong for a very right. very long time yeah. and in that moment it's formative isn't it it's those yeah it's those there's those wow points of our life that we can look back yes. on and say that yes. in that moment now that i look yes. back on it i realized yes. everything switched then yeah right and so yeah that, and then, and then you go i also on that road yeah, and, yeah absolutely yeah. And I also really quickly, and I'm just thinking this now, as I talk to talk to you all, you know, what kind of trauma is happening to all of our young people who are seeing oh, repeatedly on the news, all yeah. of these um, shootings yeah. of unarmed black people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We know that that is re-traumatizing all of the folks in yeah. those communities who know, yeah. but they're for the grace of God, it could be them, yeah. but we are re-traumatizing. Exactly. Um, we are, we are, um, and our, and our, and, and a silence about that is a way of just saying, well, that's just the way things are. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just ask actually, to, because the other thing that comes out of, comes to mind with that is just thinking, I mean, your proximity to that, uh, yeah compared to us was close but but to those in the neighborhood you you may as well have been you know a world away but you but you write about how it affected your sister and yeah. about her not wanting to sleep with the window open in the heat of the summer yeah so so if you think about the way it manifests it manifests itself in her body yes you know what does it do for a black yes. body and a child yeah, in, in philly so maybe yeah. you can say a, a quick word about what how it affected her you know because that's really quite powerful yeah, I mean, you know, I think the, the reason that there was a lot of footage on the news and it showed move members not using their front door, but kind of repelling up the side of the house to enter the house on the second or the third floor of a row home, like a standard right. row home in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. And so my sister's bedroom, you know, was over a porch roof. And so yeah. she thought, oh my gosh, we have to keep, we have to keep our family safe. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we have to, I, and it's my job. Like I, you know, I, um, and again, because it was the media portrayal of, yeah. of um, in yeah. some part of, of MOVE members as somehow being less than human or being incredibly inherently dangerous. And um, so, you know, interestingly, now she's the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, wow. um, yeah, and is oh, very wow. committed, is very committed yeah, even yeah. in her organization yes, her. with her team that they are constantly trying to educate um, the folks who are, you know, supporters of Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia, the way that race plays a role in housing insecurity in a city like Philadelphia, you know? So I think that it likely had a deep impact mm -hmm. on her sense of justice. Um, again, even though we couldn't explicitly name it and that litany of all the ways, in some ways, the spirit was kind of prompting me or making space for me to make mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. of that. And the fact that because those were predominantly white spaces, um, I was never, I was never encouraged to unearth yeah. that memory. I was never given the resources to perhaps make sense of it. It's only when I became more connected to a multicultural community that, that, that those memories started to kind of um, emerge. And then there was this realization of like, oh, wow, um, there's something to be done here. Uh, I just think that your father, whether he knew it or not, um, in many ways, gave you the primary resource that you needed uh, to be yeah. where you are today, because and your sister, like your sister is the head of Habitat. For, so I mean, I just think that, you know, as Rob says, it's formative. I mean, yeah. it 
And yes. I mean, could it have been done better? Might there have been more conversations? Could it be on back more? All of that may be true. Yeah. Um, but man, that you're doing the work you're doing. These things have shaped you in some powerful way. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. I will tell him that. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell him you said that. Yeah, because I think my mother was like, what are you thinking? And then she's dealing with children who aren't sleeping yeah. with nightmares. But don't forget. I, the thing that came to my mind is we, we, we need not forget as well that he was raised in that same silent Catholic yes, reality, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We went to the same grade school. Oh, yeah. so not at the you same know, time. Like I went not to at the same time. School, not at the same time, but like the same grade school that my my parents and their brothers and sisters went to, you know, so like, yeah, yeah. Um, right on that city line. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I know Ian wants to get in here, too. With, with something. Poor Ian. He's so prepared. <laughs> Good. Um, you read about your earliest ancestors in the United States. Yeah. The Littles, like yes. Andrew Little, is that the full yes. name? Yes. As far um, as I can tell, yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. They arrived in the 1820s, mm -hmm. a million years ago. Um, they lived <laughs> for just Ian, it's a million years ago. <laughs> Monday. Not a million Monday years ago. It was for a us. million years ago. Yeah. 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 yeah fair. In COVID, Monday was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> they lived just north of the Mason Dixon line mm -hmm. and would have no doubt. Uh, born witness to much of what was unfolding. Yeah. Um, slaves headed north seeking freedom, people hunting for all the slaves yeah. to return them to their masters, yeah. yes. um, which is a wh horrible sentence. Um, yeah. The way you read about it, it becomes very clear that the Mason-Dixon line did not represent simple or clear-cut freedom for slaves headed yes. north. Yes. Um, in describing learning about Andrew Little at and the time in which he lived, you write, and I'll read your words to you, okay. yeah. um, just for the listener's context, um, Racial mercy invites lingering in uncomfortable threshold spaces to settle mm -hmm. into a more honest reckoning with the past. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging the anti-blackness at the very beginning of my family's story can be liberating in its candor and calming in the integrity it offers. Mm -hmm. I find myself spending less energy dancing around an uncomfortable truth and more energy in purposefully discerning responsibility for it. When I'm able to acknowledge the anti-blackness in my tradition and my family history, I'm also better able to embrace anti-racist strategies that align with efforts to dismantle the structures of inequity rather than simply remaining satisfied being someone who is not racist in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. Which is, wow. Um, can you tell us more about that, about that sense of liberation that you write about? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So thank you, Ian. Um, I was super excited to kind of have this additional layer to my family tree be something I discovered um, when I went hunting in the Chester County archives, which Chester County is one of the suburban counties um, of Philadelphia. Um, and to just learn, just to learn the history of what my people were, the first people would have been experiencing coming from Ireland. And I think the place, and this is the place I realized like, I don't know that this book can really just simply about be about how we became anti, how we became white, but really how we became anti-Black. And it was that realization of that period in American history and that space in American history where the Mason-Dixon line really did not mean a whole lot in terms of meaningful Black freedom. And that my first people would have, would have um, been part of a community where they would have experienced a, a significant lack of lack of freedom on the part of black people um, a kind of economic bondage that even for freed black people um, in in the north was um, was far from um, a life of flourishing mm -hmm. um, and so you know I think the question that often preoccupies a lot of Americans um, and of like makes a lot of white Americans sort of um, jump off the hook or get off the hot seat when it comes to talking about race is like, well, my people did not own slaves, yeah. mm -hmm. right? My people did not own slaves. We all arrived, you know, in the period of immigration, some Irish Catholics will say, well, we arrived in a period of anti-Catholicism and we did not, we did not own slaves. Um, Indentured servanthood. Don't you know, my people had it yes. tough too. Yes, yes. And that's not to say that they did not, but there was real meaningful freedom for them at the end of that. And there yeah. was, even if you were an enslaved person who managed um, to escape, um, even arriving at a, in a place like Chester County did not necessarily mean that you were secure or that right. you experienced real freedom or economic um, freedom from economic hardship. So I think what's liberating um, is 
the ability to say that there is ambiguity here. In some ways, it's beside the point to discern whether or not you owned someone or did not in terms of um, responsibility for what scholars call the afterlife of slavery in the United mm -hmm. States. Because it would be very hard, especially in the Eastern seaboard, to be a white person who was not in close proximity to the black suffering that was caused by slavery, whether you were free or whether you were enslaved as a mm. black person. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that it was proximity to the social death of stuff of slavery and also our proximity to slavery's afterlife. And I really deeply appreciate the scholars who have suggested we're not talking about an aftermath. <laughs> There is a kind of um, black servitude and black bondage and black imprisonment and black disenfranchisement um, that we know continues. Um, there is strong retaliation against any kind of real expression of, um, of black worth or of, of black um, assertions of agency. So I think moving past that either that yes or no question or that either or way of thinking and entering into, again, a more liminal or ambiguous understanding of um, our proximity to the kind of suffering that, um, that slavery and then its afterlife have caused for black people, I find, you know, I find helps me put down all of the energy that a lot of white Catholics and white people, white Americans tend to spend in trying to deny that we are racists. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say it the other day, Amani Perry, who's got a great new book out, um, you know, that like we live in a racist society. So mm -hmm. it's really impossible for yeah. anybody who's white to sort of deny that. So stop mm -hmm. spending energy there yeah. and start putting the energy in places of discerning a little bit more honestly, where our stories have really close proximity either to slavery or its afterlife and start to think about what to do about that right. in collaboration with other people. And then that's where coming back to what you asked about in the beginning about power has been so remarkable because here is an outlet here is a place where i can i can be involved in 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 social change in a way that is interfaith um, is interracial um, i get to teach about that again shout out to my university that mm -hmm. lets me teach a faith-based organizing class so that you know you can help students say let's move beyond guilt let's move beyond defensiveness let's move mm -hmm. beyond shame into the kinds of um, virtues be it mercy, be it courage, mm -hmm. be it justice, be it compassion, um, that we are equally equipped to bring to movements for change. Right. And wrestle with it, as we were talking uh, about and earlier. Wrestle, Have that yeah, wrestle with and it undo because, those knots, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. I mean, to tour. quote the great, the great Cornell West, again, yeah. his name has already come up. There is freedom in the struggle. Yes. Yeah. There is well, freedom in the struggle. So. Rob, Rob, I was just thinking as Maureen was talking about, um, Anglican, uh, the Anglican reality here in Canada, as it relates to residential schools and colonialism, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. settlement settlement of our yes. country, and yes. the way and the way that our generations of our ancestors who came here, um, and the ways they participated or not, and and the, the too often the the place that we tend to hear people go is well. I didn't do that, A, that right. was generations exactly. ago, or B, exactly. well, you know, I've researched some of my family tree and we weren't really too involved in any of that. But the truth is we were all involved yeah. in it. We were Maureen's, all connected to that, yeah. Yeah, and I think Maureen's book, for those of you listening here in Canada, you might say, well, it is anti-Blackness in America. Let me tell you, um, this is relative for us here in Canada. And yeah, I, I, I encourage you to read the book. That's a great connection. I appreciate you making that connection. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, over to you, Ian. Well, well, well uh, <laughs> um, we have a new segment on this podcast, um, and it's time for for this new segment called Listener Questions. Okay. Today's question comes from our Kate. Excuse me. Today's question for our guest comes from Catherine and George. If that name sounds familiar, um, you get ten points. Um, Catherine Ann is the Director of Mission and Ministry at Brescia University College here in London, Ontario, is a Roman Catholic chaplain for the Royal Canadian Navy Reserve, and is married to 
one of the hosts of the Vickers Crossing, which I think she can put on a resume now. Catherine Ann, you... what's your question? <laughs> okay, let's hear Catherine Ann's question. Hello, Dr. O'Connell. Thank you for taking my question. I too was fortunate to have an advanced copy of your book. Thank you for that. As a director at Brescia University College, where I am responsible for mission and ministry, I am encouraged by your call for our church to reckon with the sin of racism and anti-blackness. Your honesty and vulnerability in the book has liberated me to look deeper at my own life and at generational trauma that I have been a part of. Born into it, lived it, that's what we get. But it's not where we need to go. In the book, you write about the sin of racism in terms of a collective imprisonment by an oppressive force that overpowers and compels our active and collective submission. You point out that approaching racism as a sin of captivity requires that we change our standard operating procedures when it comes to repentance. Individual repentance is not enough. Can you say more about the kind of collective repentance and lament you are calling the Catholic Church to embrace? Mm. Wow. That's a great question. Oh, yeah. She's like that. You should hear the question she comes up with over mm -hmm. dinner. Mm -hmm. That's she, good. That's she keeps, good. I, she keeps you must grilling. She, she grills the Anglican in the house. Nice. Good work. <laughs> it's good. Um, no, I, I appreciate it. And I really appreciate that um, the question comes out of the context of somebody in charge of mission and ministry, right, at a Catholic institution. Um, because I do think Catholic institutions, if we want to talk about the collective dimension here, I think it's starting to shift to thinking about the institutional responsibilities that we have. We're all members of these institutions, whether that is the parish or whether that's Brescia University or that's LaSalle University. Um, that idea of racism as a sin of, of captivity comes from um, a, uh, an anti-racist Christian leader by the name of Joseph Barnt, another one you all might wanna have on and, and have some conversations with. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I think the the kind of the kind of um, collective response that I I think we could be making institutionally would be first to have a very honest reckoning about our institutional histories, right? So I tried to do this honest reckoning with my family, situating my families putting flesh or, or, or filling out the family tree with the, with the historical context and the socioeconomic context and the political context. And I think we could be doing the same thing, these kind of critical histories, critical institutional histories mm -hmm. of, our, of our Catholic communities. Um, and to be, to be truthful, right? Mm -hmm. To speak truthfully and honestly. Um, we in the Catholic Church have this great moment for this right now because our Pope has invited mm -hmm. everybody to a synod to talk about how to be a church that's more horizontal and a church that is more engaged in dialogue and listening. Mm -hmm. So that would be my second answer to this question. Take advantage of this synod moment um, to make sure that A, we are inviting people from the peripheries, people who have been pushed by white supremacy or by sexism in our church, make sure that they are invited into the center and then we need to be quiet and listen to mm -hmm. people so that we can enter into the chaos that our institutions, our Catholic institutions have created, um, that our predominantly white Catholic institutions have created in those, in those folks' lives, um, and then risk sort of being led by the spirit in different directions. Mm -hmm. um, an image that was really helpful for me that my sister Corinne's experience after MOVE really made me think of was the disciples in the upper room, right, mm -hmm. who had witnessed the crucifixion, um, knew that there was something incredibly wrong, and were yet at the same time incredibly fearful and did not know what to do and remained huddled in that space, right? And the Pope even talks about when we are in enclosed spaces that are cut off from the world, mm -hmm. we get sick. They're not healthy spaces. And it's the spirit that, you know, is able to come in after people have pro, after the disciples have probed the wound 
<laughs> Jesus's wounds, after they do that probing and after they do that kind of reckoning, um, then the spirit comes and they're led. And I think that that the synodal moment provides us some real opportunity um, in Catholic institutions and Catholic communities for that kind of work. Wow. Well, look, I feel like we've only begun to scratch the surface of this. I just have one more question and uh, because there's so much in this book and I can't encourage sure. people enough to, to pick this up. But I really think the overarching theme of the silence, as I, as I read about, you know, as you, you, for those who haven't yet had a chance to look at it, um, Maureen moves through all the different parishes that her families over the years have been associated with. And, um, and through that examination, in each and every case, the institution at, in some way, shape or form has been silent, even after, you know, the, the, the Civil War, like for an example, and, and as you, as you uh, pour over yellow documents over and over again, you don't find any great statements from the Catholic Church about yep. this thing that just happened. Yes. You know, I had, uh, yeah, trauma. So, yep. yeah, it's incredible. So I just I want to read a little piece from the epilogue and then uh, invite a, a question on the other side. You write that as a theologian, always on the hunt for the next epiphany, unexpected moments where I encounter some kind of mind-blowing truth about my tradition. Four years of rounding the parishes, again, going back to this image of Torah, four, um, four years of rounding the parishes connected to my family's history in Philadelphia certainly kept me in a steady, no way, state of mind. But these epiphanic moments were different. For one, I didn't have to look too hard to find them. Um, clearly, anti-Blackness was unapologetically part of the business as usual, given how thoroughly it was woven into so much of the historical record of my family's parishes. Moreover, these were not exactly truths to get excited about. Mm -hmm. I experienced no joy in finding in, in sharing them and worried about how they would be received, whether by members of my family or members of the Catholic institutions to which I belong and to which I'm deeply committed. It's an in-depth journey that you write about in here, and I, I really commend you for your honesty and your vulnerability, and it really, it's, it's part history and part honest reflection on a family, um, and it's really a call to us to engage in different ways, all of us, in terms of examining our own backgrounds and our own whiteness and our own white supremacy and how that's affected all of us, whether we're in Philadelphia or London, Ontario. Um, in, in this book, you, you basically, uh, and, and I, I might get the order wrong, but um, Christchurch, St. Agnes, depending on how you look at it, I think are, mm -hmm. are, are and, yep. right. And, and a lot, so along with that, there's seven or eight communities that you walk through and a couple of institutions of higher learning, at least two or three. Um, mm -hmm. You will outline the many knots. You talk about knots of apathy, of white Catholic missionary sensibilities. Uh, so in other words, uh, if there is any conversation about blackness, it's about people that we can win souls, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, you also talk about self-preservation and even just a comfort alone that comes with in institutional power mm -hmm. um, as, as its own sort of a knot or obstacle, if you will. Um, the book is now out, came out last week. So upon reflection now and you're having opportunities like this and other mm -hmm. places to talk uh, i can't believe there's any place any better than this place but anyway there it's might been be great i thoroughly enjoyed this <laughs> it's so fantastic i mean you are on the vicar's crossing now i think mean, so uh but but you're having these conversations can you share a bit about how the work is being received uh, both from your family because i couldn't help but think as i was reading through this oh geez i just i can just imagine the defensiveness in some of our families uh yeah. if, if we yeah. try to and and also by the institutions that you you know you work at LaSalle, you've worked at others you're you're yep. uh, you're very well respected scholar in your field in in catholic circles and i just wonder how how all of it is received well, I mean, so far so good, yeah. but it's still very early. Yeah. It's still very early. Um, but no, I think, you know, for the most part, I have to give credit to my mother and her siblings for their willingness, their courage and their willingness to be forthright and to read drafts and, you know, kind of see family, family stuff uh, being aired, laundry being aired. Um, but, you know, for the most part, so far, I've heard from folks saying like, thank you for making space for me. Thank you for validating some things that I had thought. Thank you for, um, you know, 
uh, you know, validating work that I've been trying to do on my own. Um, this could be really great for the class I'm trying to teach on race and, race and ethnicity in my Catholic institution. Um, and then even, you know, in the family, um, a member of the family who, you know, is not, doesn't have the same worldview saying, I'm going to get it and have an open mind, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, um, so I wrote it for, I did not write it for other academics. I wrote it for my family members. I wrote it for other white Catholics who have had their own move experiences, who know something is wrong and are looking to sort of figure out how to move forward in a way that is different from what we've learned from the past. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm just eager to continue to learn from the book in the way that it engages mm -hmm. other people. And this is just now the next step in my own learning. And it's been great to talk with you because it affirms that, right? Mm -hmm. That there's still so much that we can learn in conversation with one another. So hopefully this opens up spaces for conversation. Yeah, and in yeah, the we, spirit, we, oh, sorry, Rob. Uh, no, go you ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, in the spirit of what we were talking about earlier, nothing without us, uh, nothing about us without us. The other uh, group that comes to mind is just how this is being received. Perhaps you're in a parish, as you say, which is becoming multicultural. How is it mm -hmm. being received amongst those that you know in the Black community? How have they affirmed you in this work? Because I must imagine for many, your honesty in this yeah. is, is, uh, is an affirming yeah. thing. I've heard, yeah. I've heard that so far, but I also know that there are parts of this that I did not get right. And mm -hmm. so I'm working hard at not being defensive about being right, but working <laughs> with others to continue to get it right. You know, so that's mm -hmm. intoning a little Br Brene Brown there for right. us. Yes. Like, yes, sir. Yeah. I need, I want to, the, the more people who get involved, the better we have it, the better chance we have of, of getting this right as we move forward. Right. So. Yeah. yeah, good. Well, we're thrilled that you could come into our space today and share some of this. Uh, Thanks. Uh, as you get the book uh, kicked off this week. And we want to let our listeners know that on our website, thevickerscrossing.com, you'll find a list of uh, books and authors that we have chatted with, including Maureen. So you can find it there and find a link to pick it up for yourself. And uh, Dr. Maureen O'Connell is our guest today. And once again, the name of the book is Undoing the Knots, Five Generations of American Catholic Anti-Blackness. So Maureen, thanks once again. And, all right. and uh, God you. bless to you and your family and everybody Thank in you. Philly. And to all of you as well. So Rob, next time you just don't turn around, just keep on I coming know. down to Philly. We'll host you in, we'll make something happen. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm there, right. awesome. I'm there. Yeah. All right. Good to talk with you all, okay? Thank you, you too, Maureen. Great conversation today. Uh, so thankful to Maureen for joining us and for the book and a uh, really honest and vulnerable look at many different aspects of, of this. And uh, yeah, I really do hope people pick it up and, and leave through it and get conversations going even in their parishes about this. So important. Great book. Yeah. Hey, want to thank our sponsors today, as always, here in the Vickers Crossing to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated. Our thanks to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved. And of course, to our friends at Molly Made, make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Made London today. And that wraps up this edition of the Vickers Crossing. And we'll be back with another one down the road. So stay Definitely. tuned. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. And I'm Kevin George from St. Aidan's Church in London as well. And my name is Ian. Thank you for listening. And Kevin, remember to always look both ways. Well, especially now with convoys going all over the place. Look oh, both ways. Trucks. Be well, convoy. Thank <laughs> a trucker before you cross the street. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!